Hello, I'm Sarah Coates, and this is Global Eye, your window to the world straight from Tel Aviv. Now, we're going to be traveling around the globe for the next hour together to give you every story you need to know. Well, on tonight's show, a cold case seems to have been cracked open with investigators saying they think they know who gave away the location of Anne Frank and it's not someone you'd expect. But we'll take you live to a weed-smoking nun who says she has a treatment for COVID and a British woman has a surefire way to escape from a bad date fast. She'll bring us all her cheeky tips, but before we get into any of that, let's start right here in Israel. What's the buzz? These are today's most trending stories. Well, the Flashpoint neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem has today been at the center of an explosive standoff between residents and cops with a Palestinian man threatening to set himself and his home on fire as his family faces eviction. Well, cops arriving in the morning to move people out, with the family refusing, telling media from the roof of the home, we've been here since the 1950s, we don't have anywhere to go. Well, the neighbourhood's been at the centre of rising tensions between Israel and Hamas, with the terror group saying it was one of the triggers for the latest round of conflict last May as Israel evicts Palestinian families to make way for Israelis. Well, with the Omicron strain of COVID spreading like wildfire throughout Israel, with hundreds of people remaining in quarantine, the country's health ministries moved to shorten the isolation period for people without symptoms to five days down from a week. But before you run for the door to escape those four walls, a vaccinated person will need two negative antigen tests to be able to escape while the unvaxxed must have their tasks done at a recognised facility. Now, we have some potentially good news for people who've lost cognitive function with Israeli scientists conducting a trial on mice, which could have the same results for humans, finding that a diet high in fat and low in carbs could help restore brain function after injury. Well, they've discovered that over a period of two months, cognitive function was restored by consuming foods like meat, fish, eggs, avocado and butter. Now, it's being hailed as a game changer. An Israeli developed startup providing cyber security for cloud data stores, which gives users a higher layer of security compared to other models out there. Now, the founders of Eureka say they've already received $8 million in funding from a ventures firm which funds and supports Israeli cybersecurity entrepreneurs from seed to lead. So what is so special about this concept? Uh, to tell us why, let's bring in Liat Tayun, who is the CEO and co-founder of Eureka Security. Liat, lovely to see you this evening. Uh, firstly... Tell us a little bit about your product and why it's been called a game changer. So to understand the product, you first need to understand uh, what, what the world of, of technology is currently experiencing. Um, and what we're seeing is that we're actually on the verge or uh, in, in the process of two transformations. Uh, we have the data transformation on one hand. Uh, more and more organizations are leveraging data to... Um, to improve processes, to create analytics, to uh, improve their marketing, and so on. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the cloud transformation that helps make that data uh, more dynamic, more flexible, and more available to relevant teams within the organization. Uh, the combination of these uh, two transformation requires a new approach to how data is now being protected within the cloud. Um, organizations are using much more cloud technologies in different cloud providers and storing large amounts of much more sensitive data. Um, and all this data needs to be monitored, needs to be controlled, and needs to uh, be uh, worked on responsibly by the different teams within the organization. So, Leah, you know... Our approach, yeah. I just want to jump in here as well. Uh, you're talking about sensitive information, and we all have a lot of that. We've seen so many data breaches in the past exposing things. People don't want to be exposed. How do we know where to go, who to trust, and where to store our data? 
So to, to be honest, um, the, the use of, of data uh, is inevitable, right? We won't stop using social networks. We won't stop using, using the, the tech that makes our lives much, much better uh, uh, by existing. Um, so storing our data within those, within those technology companies and having them store it within the cloud is basically inevitable. Um, and, and to be honest, most of the organizations we talk to uh, and the ones we work with on a daily basis do want to maintain the data correctly and want to work with it very responsibly. Um, it's just a very difficult problem. Um, and this is where uh, products like ours help them make sure that data is controlled and managed in a responsible way, that it adheres to the organizational policies that are usually, again, there, there to protect us as users um, and to help them understand how their cloud data is protected. Right, and $8 million, uh, that's a decent chunk of money. Yeah, how far will that get you? So one significant um, value <clears throat> that our platform needs to deliver is to be holistic, is to work with the cloud technologies that our customers are working with. And as mentioned before, there are many of those. So we need to make sure we have that holistic view. Well, uh, Liat Hayona, <laughs> good luck with everything. We hope you go really well and thank you very much for coming on this evening. Thanks. Moving on and the drama and suspense continues with the potential plea bargain of former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu with Netanyahu reportedly consulting his family about what to do. Well, the clock is starting to tick with only two weeks until the end of the term of Attorney General Avahai Mandelblit. Our senior correspondent Owen Altman brings us the potential political fallout. This is most of what the Israeli public saw of Benjamin Netanyahu Monday, a tweeted photo of the Netanyahu family with a fulsome thank you to supporters. The tweet came after the former prime minister canceled the planned speech before parliament. All with reports swirling in the air, Netanyahu looking at a potential plea bargain in his criminal cases, and the governing coalition pushing back against doubts about its future. I think this government will last because this government is not dependent on Netanyahu. It depends on doing things together. It depends on the connection we manage to make to different groups in Israeli society. It creates unity among the people instead of all the rift and division and incitement. The conventional wisdom is that Foreign Minister Yair Lapid is wrong, that the ideologically diverse coalition is held together by opposition to Netanyahu, that Netanyahu's departure from the political scene as part of a plea bargain would bring the coalition to an end. But the first shoe to drop would not be the coalition. It would be from Netanyahu's right-wing Likud party, where the jockeying is revving up in the race for a post-Netanyahu leader. Leading candidates, former Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat, former Finance and Foreign Minister Israel Katz, former Health Minister Yuli Edelstein, former Culture Minister Miri Regev, and a new entrant, former Justice Minister Amir Ohana. I don't rule out being a candidate. I want to see who the other candidates are. Nir Barkat is the frontrunner. The billionaire former Jerusalem mayor has polled most strongly in the past. And a recent poll by Israel's Channel 12 News shows Barkat would bring more votes in a potential general election. But much could change in the Likud race. There is a first step of picking a temporary head. Whoever gets that nod could have an advantage. And we have not heard the last from Netanyahu, especially on whom he might want as a success. And we need to go out for a short commercial break, but when we come back, a rare fatal drone attack in Abu Dhabi this morning. So who was behind it? And we'll take you live to the US for the latest on a massive winter storm, leaving a trail of destruction across the US and also Canada. We'll have both those stories and plenty more coming right up here on Global Eye. Don't go anywhere.
breathing organism that pulsates through millennia. Touch it, listen to it, smell it, taste it. Experience the Holy Land like never before. Holy Land Uncovered, every Sunday, only on I-24 News. Imagine being able to see into the future. What innovations will change the world as we know it? Join us as we meet the people changing our planet and discover the inventions shaping tomorrow. Israel Business Beat, Sundays and Wednesdays, 9.30 p.m. GMT. Zoom in, past the sound bites and beyond the numbers. Zoom in. Between the people and into the Middle East conflict, I'm Jeff Smith. Together, we'll zoom in Sunday through Thursday nights, only on I-24 News. Stranger to sanctions, and now Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has another one to add to the list. With Twitter suspending an account linked to him just days after he posted a video depicting an assassination of former U.S. President Donald Trump using a drone. Well, the threat coming two years after the assassination of the head of Iran's Revolutionary Guards, Qasem Soleimani, with Iran vowing to settle the score. Well, Iran-backed Houthi rebels are believed to be behind this attack in Abu Dhabi this morning, which has killed three people and wounded at least six others. Now, police say three fuel trucks exploded near the airport, with initial investigations showing the attack was carried out using a drone. Now, these such attacks are rare in the Emirates, although neighbouring Saudi Arabia is frequently targeted by Houthis, although the kingdom is able to intercept most of the missiles fired at it. Emergency crews are being mobilised in southern US states and throughout Canada, with a major winter storm dumping heavy snow and ice, with more than 80 million people under a strict weather warning. Well, Izzy, as a storm is known, is causing chaos, leaving tens of thousands of people without power, and majorly disrupting travel with countless flights grounded. Well, authorities are bracing for more dangerous weather, calling on people to stay off the roads, with weather forecasts showing the winter weather event is far from over. Let's take you now to Joseph Scutts, who is a New York City resident. Joseph, thank you very much for coming on to chat. Firstly, uh, tell me, what is the situation at this very hour? Yeah, well, first of all, I want to thank you so much for having me on I-24, uh, Sarah, you and the whole I-24 family. Shalom from NYC. Um, basically, the snowpocalypse, or if some some people have called it the uh, snowmageddon of 2022, it's uh, really compounded the already current existing crisis and issues that a lot of Americans are going through right now. Um, like you said, 80 million Americans are under weather alerts, uh, you know, as storms bring snow, ice, and heavy rains throughout the northeast and the east coast, the Midwest, the southeast. I can say personally, as a New York City Manhattan resident, uh, we have not nearly felt the brunt of the burden that, uh, you know, the other majority of Americans of the 80 million that have gone through this uh, crisis have felt. But I can say that, um, you know, Americans are already dealing with a lot of crises on many fronts. Uh, you know, the Omicron crisis, uh, nearly double-digit inflation, the worst inflation in 30 years, and uh, a movement called the Great Resignation, where we've seen the largest amount of people leaving the workforce who are not even considered unemployed because they're not even actively looking for a job. They're staying at home. They're looking after their kids who are doing, um, you know, Zoom classes, mm -hmm. uh, school classes. 
a lot of the same issues that families in Israel are going through. But on top of that, we have a weather crisis that's going on right now. And uh, we also have a supply chain disaster where, you know, if there hasn't already been panic that's been going on in the United States, it's only been compounded worse. Uh, this, the supply chain disaster was, you know, many ships were left on the Pacific coast during the holidays in, you know, November, December, there was a shortage of supplies. So what we saw in anticipation of this uh, snowstorm was that there was a panic run mm -hmm. four days ago. A lot of people, you could feel it even in Manhattan, which wasn't nearly as affected by these other regions. Uh, you know, there was a shortage of bread, uh, toilet paper, uh, cooking oil, and um, you know, it's it's created uh, you know just a lot of panic. Um, I can say personally that I've I have friends all over the United States. And I could give you a brief uh, recap in different regions of what's been going on in terms of, uh, you know, losing electricity and how jobs have been affected as yeah, well. Yeah, Joseph, with regards to that loss of electricity, just looking at these pictures there coming out of the US makes me feel cold. Uh, what sort of options do these people have when they're left in these freezing conditions with absolutely no power? Right. So I can tell you that um, New Yorkers, like I said before, we were told that we were going to be hit with a major bomb cyclone. Uh, what happened was that the snow dissipated into freezing rain and we have the best sanitation department by far in the United States. So that was nipped uh, right away. And uh, we basically had, you know, the, the streets salted and now we have just uh, breezes. We don't have the storm affecting us as much as other regions. But what happens is a lot of people in anticipation of this happening, they, uh, you know, they make a panic run. They go to, you know, big corporate uh, stores and entities such as Home Depot. They have to get power generators and uh, they just have to wait it out, you know, ride the storm, as they say, no pun intended. Um, you know, the ongoing major snow and ice storms impacting the Northeast uh, has you know affected us. It's going to affect more northern New York, like Rochester and Buffalo, where I have friends also, and also New England. Uh, but it's really affected uh, the brunt of the burden has affected Central America uh, and also the southeastern states. To give you an example, um, state of emergency was declared in North Carolina. Yes in South Carolina, Georgia, Virginia. And this storm essentially created four tornadoes that hit the All west right. coast of Florida. Right. And to, uh, to, just to give you, to tell you uh, what's been happening in Georgia, uh, a good colleague of mine from college, he's a father of four. Mm. He has two daughters. He's the breadwinner of the family. Uh, he basically has been having to work remote and uh, now he has no electricity. His two kids are doing Zoom at home wow. with a mom supervising. And he has no means of being able to, uh, you know, really use Certainly. the electricity. Very, very difficult, Joseph, so uh, for a lot of people there. And I suggest you stay inside and try and stay warm. Thank you so very much for coming on to chat this evening. It's an honour. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Appreciate it. Let's go now to some of the trending stories coming out of the US. While many people around the world are facing poverty as a result of the COVID pandemic, the already uber-rich have become more wealthy. An Oxfam report finding that the 10 richest men have doubled their fortunes. Well, the charity also releasing its findings about the world's poorest nations, with Oxfam saying that at least 21,000 people are dying every day as a result of poverty. Usually, Oxfam releases its report to coincide with the annual economic summit held in Davos, which will be held online once again this year as the spread of Omicron continues. Well, American Airlines is copping flack after an employee forced former Miss Universe, Olivia Culpo, to change her outfit in order to board a flight. Now, the model was wearing this. A black bralette, shorts and a long cardigan, but she was told unless she covered up, she wouldn't be allowed to fly. Well, Olivia and her sister posting the ordeal on their Instagram stories with their legions of followers commenting on how wildly inappropriate the airline staff behaved, with Colpo having to put on her boyfriend's hoodie to board, with the airline responding saying her outfit wasn't in line with its dress code. Well, vaccines, pills, Clorox, horse medicine, you name it. We've certainly been inundated with a slew of COVID remedies since the pandemic broke loose. But I want to bring you a new one, a potential way of preventing the virus that will most likely see you having fun while fighting corona. 
with a self-ordained feminist sect known as the Weed Nuns over the moon with the findings of a new study which suggests that cannabis may help prevent COVID-19. Well, the Sisters of the Valley are based in Northern California, growing and harvesting their own weed to create medicine. And for more on this story, let's bring in Sister Kate, who's the founder of the group, who joins us now from Cali. Uh, Sister Kate, lovely to see you. Firstly, uh, tell me a little bit about your community. It sounds like you guys have a very good time there. Well, we work hard. We have what is a rather traditional form of women getting together to rescue each other. We live together, work together, pray together. We create jobs together and are self-sustaining. And we're, we're a small, there's six of us that live here on a one acre farm and operate our little business. And we've been in business for seven years. And we're starting to sprout enclaves in other countries like New Zealand and Sweden and England and Brazil and Mexico. Uh, yeah, that's who we are. Amazing. Finally, you know, something fun to fight COVID rather that we're hearing about with this new study. Tell me, just how promising do you think it is? How does it all work? Well, first of all, um, the media is being very careless and irresponsible with their headlines because saying, concluding that science has found this great medical potential in the plant means you should go smoke it, is like saying that moldy bread gives you penicillin, so we should all go home and make our own moldy bread. That's insane, that's risky. Mm. Smoking has nothing to do with their study ever. What they said is they found CBDA and CBGA, that's a potential, potential inhibitor for infection, which we applaud. But I mean, what we're celebrating is the fact that science is doing serious studies of something because there was an interference. While, while the rest of the world 125 years ago started really embracing science, the cannabis plant and the hemp plant was suppressed unnaturally and illegally. So what we're rejoicing is not that getting high is gonna cure COVID, that's <laughs> insane. I mean, and also the headlines have said like, people are going to smoke weed instead of wearing their masks. I really don't think people are that stupid or that simple, but the headlines and the media is doing that right now. And the fact is, all they said is the two compounds in the plant, which is in hemp and all cannabis, but it doesn't have to be in the plant. You don't have to get it from the plant that gets you high and you don't have to smoke it to get it. Um, and I think it's just early, early studies. And so everybody needs to chill out a bit. I actually think Israel's way ahead of us and has done many, many more studies. But, you know, when America does something, they think they invented it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about then your product. I, I take it from what you just told me, you know, walking around all day smoking a joint. What are you doing with it? Uh, we make salves and tinctures. Purposely, we were born of the idea that smoking cannabis is harmful to you, and yet there's medicine in there. So we came out of the shoot seven years ago making alternatives to smoking because no one in this day and age, three-year-olds in this day and age, know that fire and smoke and carcinogens in your lungs are bad for you. So we set out. So we make tinctures and salves that have indeed those compounds that science is now seriously studying. So, you know, lastly, uh, I'm not a doctor, you're not a doctor, so I don't want to go and spruik any medical advice to our viewers, uh, but what do you have to say uh, for somebody who might, you know, go and consume some weed or smoke a joint uh, in a bid to ward off COVID? I would, say, oh, I would say that, you know, smoking is not cool. Try to find something else. You can make a tincture out of it yourself very easily. And you can make home remedies, YouTube. Heck, we got our first recipes from YouTube. So smoking would be the last choice. What smoking is good for is if you have panic attacks or something, but even tinctures will help. So I think if you're serious about warding off COVID, you take some CBD in a tincture or oil drops or in a gel cap form every day, along with your vitamin C and your elderberry and the <laughs> other things we all, vitamin D, the other things we all started taking when COVID hit and we thought we were going to die.
Well, Sister Kate, there's some great advice and uh, good luck with your business. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure. Bless you. Pleasure. All right, we're taking you out for a short break, but when we come back, we're going to give you some fail-proof tips to escape from a bad date. And let me tell you, any one of us can do it. And more than 70 years after the death of Anne Frank, we now know who ratted her out to the Nazis. We'll tell you who it was coming right up. Don't go anywhere. By midnight tonight, thieves will have stolen 2,400 vehicles across the U.S. today. So when you buy your next car, ask your dealer for Recover. With Recover, you'll always be able to find a forgotten parking spot or know if your car gets towed or moved without your permission. And most importantly, you'll be able to easily share your car's location with police so they can recover it for you. Stay in control and protect what's yours. Ask your dealer for Recover today. On the inside of political and religious passions in Jerusalem. Breaking down the financial trends shaping the global economy. Giving you key context, not just headlines. With the stories from Israel that touch the U.S. and those across the region with impact far beyond its borders. Catch the rundown where the Middle East meets the world. Breaking news again. But there's always more to the story, especially here in the Middle East. Looks like the Middle East is always about to go to war. Or is it? What's really going on in the region? Well, unless you're actually here, you can't really tell. Join us here at the beating heart of the new Middle East. To get a true perspective on what's really going on. Middle East Now with Jacob Elon and Laura Sellier. Weekday nights, only on I-24 News. Zoom in. Past the sound bites and beyond the numbers. Zoom in between the people and into the Middle East conflict. I'm Jeff Smith. Together, we'll zoom in Sunday through Thursday nights, only on I-24 News. Today I'm making what we call tasbih, a mix of two Israeli staple dishes, falafel and sabich. Sabich is a sandwich based on a traditional Iraqi Jewish dish made for a Shabbat breakfast. It's made of eggs and eggplant, and in the past it was served on a plate. Israel is a melting pot of different ethnicities, which create an interesting fusion cuisine. Falafel comes from Egypt and sabich is Iraqi, but both were adopted as Israeli dishes. Sabich came much later, but falafel has been around since the early 50s. We're in Netanya, a city in central Israel. This place is called Tovas Falafel, named after my grandmother who opened it in the 50s. Back then it was just a small stand selling falafel with tahini. In the mid-90s, my older brother and I decided to embrace this heritage and to kick it up a notch. We added a couple of dishes. We make everything ourselves. The pita bread, the falafel balls, the special salads. It's all homemade. Ever since this place opened, I remembered my mother feeding the less fortunate. Sometimes people who arrive here are short of money. I can't turn my back on those hungry people, so I let them eat for free. I'm pretty sure 20% of our customers don't pay, and I'm blessed to be able to allow that. Feeding people is not about making money. There's much satisfaction in it.
welcome back. Tell me, how would you like to sit on a throne and have booze tipped over your head? Well, you may be in luck with a search underway to find someone or a monarch, as advertisers are wording it, to run a pub in Crumbia in the English countryside. Well, there's no catch. Applications are open with new caretaker needing to be there by the summer, with the successful candidate being responsible for maintaining the ship in and its grounds. Oh, and with the booze on your head thing, that is how you'll be crowned. Well, I suggest you hold your horses before you try this next stunt at home. What you're seeing here is a purification ritual during the Spanish festival of Las Luminaris with riders jumping their horses through bonfires. Wild, right? Well, it's a tradition that's been happening now for thousands of years to protect animals from getting sick, with revelers dismounting after singeing their steed to enjoy a night of drinking. Well, it's pretty safe to say most people would need a few stiff ones after riding a horse through fire. Stunning scenes coming out of Greece with the island blanketed in snow, the normally shiny blue Mediterranean paradise transforming into a winter wonderland buried under metres upon metres of snow. Now, the island's mayor saying he hasn't seen this much in more than a decade, with a cold front causing freezing temperatures along with strong winds, bringing down trees with many homes now without power, with emergency teams deployed to pump out flooded homes and rescue people who are trapped. Now, she was the one that gave the world the most detailed testimony of the Holocaust from a child's perspective. I'm talking about Anne Frank, the Dutch Jewish teenager whose diary turned into the most read account of life during the war. Now, she died at just 15 years old in a Nazi concentration camp after two years in hiding with a new investigation into who gave her up finally yielding results. Well, the probe to crack the cold case has been running now for more than six years involving historians an ex-FBI agent and the use of modern technology. So the question that remains is, who told on Anne Frank? Let's bring in Moshe Zimmerman, who is a historian at the Hebrew University. Thank you so very much for coming on, Moshe. Firstly, yeah, the most pressing question, who gave her up? We don't know yet. <clears throat> the new research tries to make us believe that it was a Jew who turned the family Frank in. That is, a man by the name of Van Berg was a member of the Judenrat of Amsterdam. This is the news of today. I don't know whether these news are uh, conclusive. We have already a very long list of people who may have turned the family uh, Frank uh, in. There is a long discussion about it. It is an open question yet. And uh, Mr. Zimmerman, tell me, you know, how common was it for Jews to collaborate with Nazis? I'm assuming, you know, this could not have been an easy choice. One has to remember who the perpetrators were. It was the German the Germans, they put Jews also under pressure. And under this pressure, like mice in a trap, there were also Jewish collaborators. We have <clears throat> quite a number of, uh, let's say, infamous uh, collaborators in Amsterdam, in Berlin, in other places. <clears throat> it's not an exception. If the news are right about this specific guy, by the name of Van Berg, he joins a larger group of Jews who were forced to collaborate with the system under the pressure of the system. So, you know, how much work has really gone into this investigation? Uh, I assume it would have been extremely labour intensive. There were about 20 people uh, that were uh, a part of this uh, investigation. They try to use uh, modern techniques in order to find out who of all the uh, possibilities of the people who uh, were uh, around the family may have been the collaborator, may have been the one 
will turn them uh, in. Uh, this is something uh, which was a joint, uh, a joint effort of journalists and uh, people from uh, the United States. You mentioned already the uh, um, FBI agent or has been FBI agent who joined the group. They did a job. Uh, they promised a, a sensation. They promised it already four or five years ago, and now they came up with the sensation just uh, before a, a new book about the, so, the story has to appear. It's a kind of a promo for the new book of uh, Mrs. Uh, Sullivan. And very briefly, uh, Mr. Zimmerman, now that this potential person has been identified, where does it go? Nowhere. First of all, all people involved are already dead. Secondly, there is such a long list of people who were suspected of being those who uh, turned uh, the family Frank in that uh, this name is only going to join the longer list of uh, previous names. And after all, we are interested in this question all, only because of Anna Frank. <clears throat> it's like the question of who shot uh, Bobby Kennedy or John Kennedy. There are questions are, that are very intriguing for the general public, but we have to know that there were many, many Jews uh, who were betrayed by others, by Jews, by non-Jews, and were sent to the uh, uh, concentration camps. So it's not only the question of Anna Frank. It's a very general question, a general question for historians to deal with. Mr. Moshe Zimmerman, uh, we really appreciate you speaking to us this evening. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right, let's move on. And on Saturday, British citizen Malik Faisal Akram held four people hostage at the congregation Beth Israel Synagogue in the suburb of Dallas. Well, after a 10-hour standoff with local police, the attacker was shot dead, but the hostages freed. Batya Levinthal has more on how an FBI-led investigation is now likely to spread across continents. It's a dramatic story that started in Texas and has now made its way to southern Manchester, Britain. As part of the ongoing investigation into the attack that took place at a synagogue in Texas on 15th January 2022, officers from counter-terror policing Northwest have made two arrests in relation to the incident. Two teenagers were detained in South Manchester and remain in custody for questioning. Reports are also coming out of the United States saying that the detained teens are the sons of the attacker Malik Faisal Akram. Akram was said to be in contact with them during the siege on Saturday, contradicting the FBI's information that said the attacker was working alone. Other members of the attacker's family, however, have been cooperating with the police and condemned the attack. What was also initially disputed was the motive behind this attack. We do believe from our engagement with this subject that he was singularly focused on one issue uh, and it was not specifically related to the Jewish community. I wanted to make sure we got the word out to synagogues and, and places of worship that we're not going to tolerate this, that we have this capacity to deal with assault on particularly the anti-Semitism that has grown up. The Israeli premier seems to share the same views as his American counterpart. This event is a stark reminder that the dark forces of anti-Semitism still exist. We must and we will fight it. The FBI has now said it will be investigating the Texas hostage standoff as a, quote, terrorism-related incident. Officials believe Akram was motivated by a desire to release a Pakistani neuroscientist who is serving an 86-year sentence in the state for an attack on U.S. officers in Afghanistan. The investigation, which now also looks to involve Pakistan, the U.S. and the U.K., will primarily focus on the attacker, his motives and anyone who may have helped him. Not much is known at this point, including whether Akram was mentally ill, nor how he entered the United States with a criminal background. Officials are hopeful that the recent arrest of two alleged accomplices in Manchester will provide some answers. After this, we'll take you live to a British woman who has a foolproof way of getting the hell out of a bad date. Don't go anywhere.
esta semana en News 24 y le contarás a tus hijos a siete años de la muerte de Alberto Nisman. Testimonios exclusivos sobre el asesinato del fiscal que investigaba el atentado a la AMIA. Big Bang político en Israel, Netanyahu a punto de llegar a un acuerdo en sus juicios por corrupción. Tributo a Santana, Fernando Knopf y su conjunto Latin Power interpretan los más grandes éxitos del legendario guitarrista Carlos Santana. News 24, el magazine semanal en español de i24 News. Imagine being able to see into the future. We can take you there. What innovations will change the world as we know it? Where can you get the most bang for your buck? I'm Natasha Kirchuk, journalist, traveler, and the host of Israel Business Beat. Join us as we meet the people changing our planet and discover the inventions shaping tomorrow. Israel Business Beat, Sundays and Wednesdays, 9.30 p.m. GMT. Welcome back. Now, have you been on a really, really bad date? Well, pretty sure we've all been there and getting out of it can sometimes be tricky, but this woman in the UK has come up with an exceptionally good idea we can all use, with COVID showing it does have some upsides to it, with Cully here going to the bathroom, returning with a fake text saying she's positive. You're not going to believe it. I was testing positive. And he was like, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I'm going to have to go home. Basically, she says I'm positive. And then I changed the name to NHS PCR test. <laughs> and then after that, I went to see a club with my friend and I slept with somebody anyway. I literally went to his, slept with him. I wouldn't even fully sleep with him. I literally slept with him for like probably two minutes. And then I was like, this is boring. So I was like, I need to go. Well, as you can see, it worked and she got out of that terrible encounter with the video going viral on TikTok. So next time you need to bail, you know exactly what to do. All right, let's go to the woman herself, Carly Thompson, joining us live from London. Uh, good evening. Love this story. Firstly, Carly, tell us about this date from hell. Why was it so bad? It was just so awkward. It was like trying to squeeze like water from a brick. There was just no <laughs> conversation. It was so awkward. And I just, I was there for 45 minutes and I knew I just needed to get out of there. Wow. And tell me, uh, how did you come up with this idea? It's uh, pretty good. I like it. Yeah, I think I just kind of like, I'm really good at thinking on the spot, but I've kind of used it before, but not on the date. So if I've set up a date, but I just can't be bothered to go on it, it's quite a good excuse to say, I actually have caught COVID last minute, so I can't make it. Um, so I just, I was like, it's my friend, you need to send me a text to help me get out. <laughs> and, and what about, you know, his reaction when you brought your phone out, showed him this text, text uh, rather, that said, I've got corona. How did he react and uh, run us through the rest of the night? Yeah, so he was actually, um, he wasn't worried for himself, but he was quite worried for me. And he was like, oh, you know, do you, do you need me to book you an Uber home? Which made me feel even worse. And he did text me when I got home saying, oh, I can't believe you caught COVID. And I just I just didn't reply, which I felt awful about. Uh, and then afterwards, because like, I'd already had a couple of glasses of wine, I went and met some friends. I actually went out um, to a club and I ended up meeting somebody out that night anyway. So um So, yeah, it wasn't at a complete loss, I guess. Oh, la la. And tell me, uh, Carly, uh, what is it like dating during COVID? You know, especially there uh, in Britain, you've had so many lockdowns, so many restrictions. It must really make, you know, a difficult situation even harder. Yeah, it, it is. It definitely is. You have to be careful now and take tests before and you are putting other people at risk by going on dates or, you know, having sleepovers with other people. Um, and I think the dating scene's just changed as well. I think that everybody was in lockdown for so long that they now don't really want to be locked down into relationships. Everyone's just out there for fun and it's quite hard to kind of draw proper connections with people. But, but yeah. <laughs> for sure. And tell me, have you got any other tricks up your sleeve like this one? Um, I don't think so. I think that's probably the main one that, that I've used. I mean, there's the classic one where you say, oh, um, 
you know, you text your friend and you're like, say, I've got an emergency, things like that. Um, but that's probably the best, the best one that I've come up with. <laughs> well, I think it's uh, great. And I do know a few people here in this newsroom that have already said they're going to use it. Carly, good luck with the rest of it. And thank you so much for coming on to talk to us this evening. Thank you so much. Pleasure. All right, let's see what else is happening in the world. Well, mass protests against military rule in Sudan with thousands of people descending toward the presidential palace in Khartoum. Police responding, firing volleys of tear gas. demonstrations like this have been a common occurrence since October's military coup that saw a power-sharing agreement fall over. Now, since the unrest began, dozens of people have been killed in the clashes as people there demand a return to civilian rule. Well, Al-Qaeda-linked Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility for this suicide bomb blast in the capital, Mogadishu, which has wounded a government official with the country's Prime Minister calling the incident an odious terror attack. Well, the bomber blowing himself up at a road junction where the victim was passing in this white four-wheel drive, with witnesses saying the government spokesperson was seen lying outside the car after the attack. Well, Al-Shabaab is fairly active in the area, often targeting peacekeeping troops as it continues to try and topple the central government, imposing its own interpretation of harsh Islamic law. Well, the tiny Pacific nation of Tonga continues to reel in the wake of last weekend's volcanic eruption and subsequent tsunami with this new video coming to light, showing the blast with plumes of smoke and ash rising miles into the sky. Most communication to the island is now cut, but the death toll still unknown, with many nations like Australia and New Zealand mobilising aid to Tonga, which remains cut off from the rest of the world. Well, tell me, could you do this when you were three years old? How good is this little Chinese lord of the board who looks like she's well on her way to becoming a snowboarding sensation? But wait for it. It's only taken Wang here 12 days of practice to get to this stage, with her mum and dad saying that she started to become very interested in snow sports with the Winter Olympics happening very soon in her home country. Well, what do you think? Can a domestic abuser be cured? The Israeli government is funneling $50 million in funding toward combating domestic violence and part of it's going to a new treatment program for abusers to see if they have an impact. Natasha Kirchak has more. My name is Igor, and 10 years ago, I was arrested for abusing my wife, physically and verbally. She filed a restraining order against me, and after going through trial, I was given two options, to go to jail or to go through treatment. So that's what I did, and it changed my life. For the last decade, Igor has been in therapy designed for men who have a history of domestic violence so that he can unlearn his abusive behavior. And today, he serves as a guidance counselor for other batterers in a unique program. They're all living in Israel's first government-funded apartment for men who have been restrained from their families for being violent. In exchange for housing, these men need to commit to getting treatment. I grew up seeing abuse. My father would beat my mother. I was raised in Uzbekistan in a society where it was believed that a man is better than a woman, that the husband should be in charge of the wife. When I went into therapy, I didn't think it would change anything. I was deeply depressed and I blamed my wife for everything. I thought she was the reason that I would get so angry and do bad things. But after I began treatment, it helped me understand how my behaviors were wrong and how I have to take responsibility for my actions. the start of the coronavirus pandemic, domestic violence reports have skyrocketed. And in the last year alone, the Israeli Welfare Ministry has seen a 10% increase in calls to its domestic violence hotline. Most of the time, after men have been reported for being abusive, they find themselves in the hands of the police or the courts with a restraining order that doesn't allow them to go back home for days or even months. And they become lost and even angrier with the partners they've been abusing. 
This is where we come into the picture. We don't want them going back home without the tools to control themselves because they end up going home and still being violent to their families or in their new relationships. So we want to treat them. Avri Sutton is a social worker and the manager of this apartment in central Israel, which houses up to six men getting therapy for abusing their partners and families. It's the first of four that are being planned by the welfare ministry to try and flip the script on how domestic violence is addressed in Israel. The primary reason we're helping these men is to stop them from reoffending. Each man who comes to the apartment must go through six months of treatment. Here he has a place where he can sleep and where he can eat, a base to come back to after he goes to work. None of these men are allowed to stay in the apartment unless they're working. And at night when they get home from work, they have treatment. They have group therapy, they have guidance counselors and social workers who train them how to deal with their anger. Israel doesn't require compulsory treatment for abuse of men. A violent man can seek help from centers for the prevention and treatment of domestic violence. But government data shows that only about a quarter of those being treated in these centers are men, and the rest are battered women and children. In the United States, it's different. Domestic abusers are rarely sent to prison. Instead, they're often sent to a special kind of class designed to teach them to refrain from physical violence. The methods employed by these groups, known formally as batter intervention programs, educate men about how their abusive behavior mimics the repressive structure of the patriarchy. But can you cure a domestic abuser? So if a person has difficulties with emotion regulation, then learning about the patriarchy and why violence against women is wrong isn't necessarily going to help you learn new behaviors, learn to understand your emotions, and be able to manage them better. Most studies show that better intervention programs have a minimal effect on whether participants continue to abuse their partners. So this isn't to say that we shouldn't have intervention for people who cause harm. What I think it means is that we need to have more tailored intervention. 50% of the men who go through our treatment make it through the first three months here in Ramat Gan. And many will continue their treatment for years, but a lot of men fail to make it through their treatment because they refuse to recognize their mistakes. It comes down to this. Rehab won't work for men who aren't willing to change. I don't want to get back to being an abuser, and I hope that I won't. I can't tell you what will happen tomorrow, but for the last seven years, I've been in a healthy relationship, and I now have the tools to control my anger and communicate, and I hope to help other men like me who also have open hearts. Moving on, and Betty White would have been 100 years old today, and fans can mark the occasion at the movies. David Daniel has that and plenty more in today's Hollywood Minutes. Hello, I'm Betty White. Betty White, a celebration, was more than a decade in the making and includes the final on-camera interview with the much-loved entertainer just days before her death on New Year's Eve. It's set to play in more than 1,500 U.S. theaters tonight only, what would have been White's 100th birthday. Check fathomevents.com for locations. Celine Dion has canceled the final 16 shows of her Courage World Tour. The singer is dealing with severe and persistent muscle spasms, according to a post on her Instagram account. The same issue prompted Dion to postpone her Las Vegas residency last October. Nearly six years of legal wrangling has finally resulted in an agreement on the value of Prince's estate. According to the Minneapolis Star Tribune, it's $156.4 million, nearly twice the appraisal of the estate's administrator. If the administrator, the IRS, and Prince's heirs agree, the process of distributing Prince's wealth could begin next month. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. And that is all we have time for today here on Global Eye. But come back tomorrow. We have some very, very special surprises in store for you, rather. But feel free to catch up on the show on Facebook or on i24news.tv. And for all of us, good night.